On the night of January 12, 1971, two bombs exploded outside the London home of Robert Carr MP. Carr was Edward Heath's employment minister and the man responsible for the hated Industrial Relations Bill, which had passed into law earlier that day. These bombs were the 18th in a group of 25 armed actions in Britain, claimed by anarchist and libertarian socialist groups, calling themselves the First of May Group and the Anger Brigade. The Anger Brigade itself first emerged in the summer of 1970 in the run-up to the election of the Conservative government of Edward Heath, and its activities continued for 18 months. The Anger Brigade actions, intended as symbolic, were followed by communiques explaining why the targets had been chosen and the group's commitment to rank-and-file organisation and international solidarity. Targets included the embassies of repressive regimes, high-profile police stations and army barracks, sweatshop boutiques and factories, as well as government buildings. The homes of cabinet ministers, the Attorney General and the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police were also targeted. Scotland Yard and MI5 launched a massive investigation which led, in August 1971, to a number of arrests and two major trials at the Old Bailey, in which three men and two women received heavy jail sentences. Five others, myself included, were acquitted. Gordon Carr's film for the BBC explores the roots of the Anger Brigade in the context of the revolutionary ferment of the 1960s and follows their campaign and the police investigation to its culmination in the Stoke Newington 8 conspiracy trial at the Old Bailey. It turned out to be the longest criminal trial in British legal history. Carr's 1973 documentary, which begins in 1967 with the machine gunning of the UC in London's Grosvenor Square, remains the most comprehensive account so far of the complex police investigation and the court case that followed. Read no more roads, my son. Read timetables. They're to the point. And roll the sea charts out before it's too late. Be watchful. Do not sing. For once again the day is clearly coming when they will brand refusers on the chest and nail up lists of names on people's doors. Learn how to go unknown. Learn more than me. Learn to change your face, your documents, your country become adept at every petty treason. August the 20th, 1967. The time, a quarter past eleven. A white Ford Cortina drives down Park Lane in London's West End. In the car, three men, young Spanish anarchists. They turn into Grosvenor Square, draw alongside the American Embassy, Four years later, the gun used in that attack was found under a table in an Anger Brigade commune in North London. How it got there, who handled it as it passed from group to group, sums up the development of anarchism, once the sole concern of a few Spanish expatriates, to a movement that introduced a new form of urban guerrilla activity that grew to the lives of cabinet ministers was seriously at risk. It was from here, in the back streets of Brussels, among the thousands of migrant workers from all over Europe, and especially from Spain, that the attack on the Grosvenor Square Embassy was planned. Planned principally by this man, Octavio Alba Rola, a Spanish-born anarchist, a dedicated revolutionary, known to the security services in at least three countries as one of the most dangerous men in Europe. In Britain, 
He's seen as the contact man and father figure of the group that became the Angry Brigade. Like many other Spanish exiles before him, Alberola found Belgium a tolerant country, reasonably safe from the attentions of the Spanish secret police, and with its anarchist cafes, bars and clubs, almost like home. At first, Alberola was influenced by an older generation of political militants, traditional anarchists who've often paid a heavy price for their opposition to the Franco regime. Miguel Garcia was sentenced to death, spent weeks in a condemned cell, was reprieved and spent 20 years in jail. Uh, because we think that the, the more intelligent people, the ones who have not the right to use this, this superiority, intelligent superiority, to exploit the other. The same as the one who is stronger physically has not the right to abuse his strongness. Uh, that is the way. Put simply, Garcia's generation want an end to all forms of authority in personal and political life. No government, no legal system, no civil service, no bosses. It's an anarchist ideal that Garcia fought for in the Spanish Civil War and lost. And his generation spent the years that followed in prison, in exile, or engaged in guerrilla resistance against the Franco regime. It was a resistance that ended effectively with the death of the most famous guerrilla of them all, Francisco Sabate. He was cornered in 1960 by government troops in a farmhouse in the Catalan mountains. He managed to escape badly wounded, but five of his companions were killed, and Sabate himself was caught and later shot. His death was a turning point in the development of anarchist activity in Europe. It brought Miguel Garcia's generation to an end. These were men who'd operated openly in Spain against Spanish targets. But new young men were emerging with new ideas and subject to new influences. Octavio Alberola was one of these new men. Alberola had worked in Mexico with Fidel Castro and Che Guevara preparing the Cuban invasion. And what they'd done in Latin America, he decided to try in Europe. We met him at a secret hideout on the continent and he agreed to talk about some of his efforts to revive and reshape traditional Spanish anarchism into an anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist international movement. Through an interpreter, Alberola told us that soon after Sabate's death, a new and highly secret organization, known as the DI, the Défense d'Intérieur, was formed to coordinate these new anarchist developments. And by chance, the DI were helped in their task of internationalizing the Spanish movement by the Spanish government itself. Uh, well, Garotted, Garotted, you see? Mm. Delgado and Granados, two anarchists in Spain. And there has been a very big repression all over Europe, especially in France and in Italy too, against anti-Francist militants, but especially anarchists. The execution of Delgado and Granados got worldwide publicity and many people were shocked. One young Briton in particular was disturbed by what he felt was excessive Spanish repression. Stuart Christie was brought up in a mining area of southwest Scotland. At the age of 16 he was a member of the Anti-Nuclear Committee of 100. At 17 he joined the Glasgow Federation of Anarchists. I couldn't stand by and watch as an onlooker and say, well, there's nothing I can do. There was nothing I could do, and that was take an active part in the resistance. Well, what did you do? I approached the resistance organization, the Libertarian Resistance Organization, and offered my services. What did they in ask what, you? In whatever they, they saw fit to employ me. And how was that? I was employed as a courier, transporting explorers between point A and point B, which was Madrid. And you were picked up in Madrid? I was picked up in Madrid in August 1964. And sentenced to 20 years? I received the sentence of 20 years I, on the 1st of September. I was tried by a council of war and military court-martial, which was all over, all over within an hour. In fact, I knew very little of what was actually being said, and nothing, in fact, of what was being said during the, during the proceedings. I wasn't told at the time either um, what the sentence was. This was passed to me two or three days later. A little note was slipped under the cell door saying that uh, the probable date of release was 1984, which was... Uh, I was not too pleased with. 
Christie's capture was a sign of just how effective the Spanish secret police had become in penetrating and dealing with the new revitalised anarchist movement. So, to protect themselves, the DI decided to set up totally secret guerrilla cells. Alberola was to be the link between these new cells and the outside world, and he was soon having to justify the exploits of the most notorious of them, the 1st of May group. Yeah, he says that it's a group of Spanish uh, militants that w came from Spain to Italy to make this... Alberola explained that the group that, uh, took its name from the day they kidnapped the Spanish legate to the Vatican in Rome in 1966. Soon it was Britain's turn, with that attack in 1967 on the American Embassy in Grosvenor Square. Six months after the Grosvenor Square attack, a message came into Reuters press agency in Fleet Street about an explosion in Turin. Some minutes later, another report from The Hague with details of three attacks on Spanish, Italian and Greek property. Then news of an explosion at the Spanish Embassy in London and yet another at the American Officers Club in Lancaster Gate. Six explosions, six locations, three countries, and all claimed by the 1st of May group. Years later, the three London incidents were regarded by the authorities as the beginnings of the Angry Brigade conspiracy. In the middle of all this 1st of May activity, Octavio Alberola was arrested in Belgium for entering the country illegally. Stuart Christie, now back in Britain after serving just three years of his 20-year sentence, began to campaign for him through the International Black Cross, a movement he'd revived to help anarchist prisoners. In 1967, well, during the period I was in prison, I realised that the only people who were receiving any assistance whatsoever from the outside, that is, outside the organisations the prisoners belonged to and their immediate families, the only people who received assistance were members of the Communist Party and uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Everyone else was, was forgotten. In Britain, Christie edited a Black Cross bulletin in collaboration with Albert Meltzer, a lifelong anarchist who worked with him on a book, The Floodgates of Anarchy. Christie's Black Cross organisation soon caught on abroad. It was, and still is, in operation in more than a dozen countries and three of its representatives have died in conflict with the authorities. It was largely because of Stuart Christie's connections with the Black Cross movement that in Britain the security services had already made up their minds that it was Christie who'd import revolutionary ideas and spread them among the country's youth. But in their concern to keep an eye on Christie, they overlooked the parallel and much more important influence coming into Britain from quite another direction. In the early 60s, the Haight-Ashbury district of San Francisco had become a gathering point for young student dropouts who suddenly felt that wherever they'd come from, and that was usually a well-ordered, well-off, secure home, was no longer the place to stay. They wanted an alternative to the materialist, consumer-based, authoritarian society offered by an older generation. They experimented with drugs, dress, food, anything that got away from middle-class, middle-morality, middle-America. Towards the end of the 60s, this American attempt to revolutionise lifestyle met up with Europe's revitalised anarchism. It was an explosive mixture sparked off by just a handful of students at one university. At Nanterre, on the outskirts of Paris, at the beginning of 1968, a dozen or so students calling themselves Les Enragés, the Angry Ones, a name they'd borrowed from the French Revolution, were what's known as Situationists. Their ideas are complex, but their techniques are simple. You create a situation. Anything will do, so long as it annoys the authorities enough to make them react. You then turn that reaction to your own advantage. At night, Situationists did just that. The students wanted educational reforms. The situationists backed them up by pelting the professors with fruit, interrupting lectures. As they'd hoped, eventually, two of them were expelled. Riots broke out, protesting against their dismissal. The effect had been achieved. Within a matter of weeks, the riots had spread from Nanterre to the streets of Paris itself.
soon the Sorbonne itself was totally in the hands of the students, and not just those who'd been studying there. Hundreds joined in from all over Europe, including, of course, from Britain. Christopher Bott, acquitted at the Anger Brigade trial four years later, was one person drawn to Paris that year. Well, in the slogan of the times, the imagination was seizing power over in France. I could only sense this from what I saw in the newspapers, but I knew that there there was a social revolution going on, where real forms of liberation were taking place. And I was comparing that with the, the boring, dull, stultified atmosphere of, of Britain at that particular time. Comparing that to, to France, where the revolutionary forces were not small groups of middle-class radicals, but 10 million people who'd taken the factories, um, millions of people who were on the streets. And over here, comparing it to the passive, easy consumption of, of a life behind the television screen. Bott and the young people with him heard among the dozens of attempts to draw up some kind of revolutionary policy the views of people like Danny Cohn Bendit and of course the views of the situationists abolish all hierarchies, shut down the universities, take over the factories other groups didn't agree, the arguments were long, often heated another young Briton in Paris that year was particularly impressed by the situationists John Barker then at Cambridge began to translate some of their pamphlets. Barker was eventually deported from France and went back to Cambridge full of situationist ideas. He wasn't there to see the whole revolutionary movement collapse into a trade union demand for a pay rise. To those like Barker, inspired by events in Paris to work for the new order, it was all sadly dispiriting. But there was one last hope. A huge anti-Vietnam war demonstration had been organised for October that year in Grosvenor Square. A hundred thousand people were expected to march through the streets of London in another international and possibly revolutionary event. But with Paris very much in mind, the authorities took no chances, and as the demonstrators crowded into Grosvenor Square itself, the police were there in strength, and managed to control the proceedings for most of the time. Once again, the established order had stood firm and for those who were hoping to get from the demonstration some kind of revolutionary situation, it was a disappointment. They realised now that big demonstrations were a waste of time. The authorities had learnt how to cope with them. What was needed now, they felt, was a much more direct challenge to society, if necessary, outside the law. It was in West Germany that the first evidence of this new style confrontation with the state emerged following the disappointments of Paris and Grosvenor Square. The Bader-Meinhof group, or Red Army Fraction as they're sometimes called, decided quite simply to declare war on German society. The police were held at bay for almost two years, and as an example of how a small urban guerrilla group could terrorise a whole country, the Bader-Meinhof people were impressive. Not until the arrest of Andreas Bader himself in a Frankfurt suburb was the back of the resistance finally broken. But it wasn't only in Germany that these small guerrilla groups were forming themselves. Even Switzerland had one, so did the Dutch and the Turks. The Italians had a total of 145 explosions in 1969 alone. Britain had its Spanish influence first of May group, and in fact, after a bomb attempt in March 1969 at the Bank of Bilbao in Covent Garden, two 1st of May men were caught with a communique in their pockets. But in Britain, other forms of urban violence were growing. In August 1969, in London, a petrol bomb was thrown at the Ulster office. And though not much of an incident on its own, in fact it was crucial to the development and the fate of the Anger Brigade itself. Ian Purdy, who'd been active in protest movements for a number of years, was arrested and charged with throwing the bomb. He was sentenced to nine months and later sent to Albany Prison in the Isle of Wight. There he met Jake Prescott, a small-time criminal and drug addict, 
who'd lived in institutions for most of his life. Purdy struck up a friendship with Prescott and began to interest him in politics. He, he realised that one could Ian Purdy. change from struggling as an individual, which he's done all his life, struggled against his conditions, struggled against things that he's been subjected to, but as an individual, and he realised, I think, that, that struggling collectively is, is more coherent struggling collectively has more has more strength has more power and this leads further into into struggling with his class which is is basically how he did change I think or how his attitudes changed how he came to realize that there were different forms of struggle while Purdy was educating Prescott in Albany prison outside the first of May group were making the headlines again with another concerted attack this time at airports in four countries flying Spanish Iberia Airlines at Heathrow, a hold-all with a bomb in it was taken off an Iberia plane after someone had called Scotland Yard. Then, just 12 days after this, came the first sign that the 1st of May, as a violent revolutionary group, were not alone. Scientists at the Forensic Laboratory at Woolwich discovered that an unexploded bomb found at the site of the new Paddington Police Station had a makeup almost identical to its 1st of May predecessors. But the target was obviously different. There was nothing remotely Spanish about Paddington Police Station. Obviously, the 1st of May group were lending their explosives, if not their expertise, to someone else. In the months that followed, more bombs or their fragments were examined at Woolwich, and forensic experts began to notice a distinct pattern to them. It was the targets that defied definition the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, the Attorney General, a BBC outside broadcast van at the Miss World Contest, the Department of Employment and Productivity. And though the security services, the police and the special branch, didn't realise it at the time, the answer in fact lay in the people, the politics and the new lifestyles that were developing from the mixture of the American hippie movement and Europe's Alberola-style revolutionary anarchism. Again, it was in West Germany that this new libertarianism first caught on, and it was there that it claimed its first martyr, Georg von Rauch. Von Rauch was Stuart Christie's equivalent in the International Black Cross organization in West Germany, and it was von Rauch, more than anyone else, who fired the imagination of the revolutionary movement that was developing out of the 68 events. These people admired the way the bader meinhof group had taken up the challenge to society and they organised themselves to help them. If the group were at the top of the pyramid, then these people are the base, thousands who, though they wouldn't necessarily let off a bomb themselves, are sympathetic to those who do. The words and the music are anti-authoritarian, anti-society. This isn't the sound of protest, it's the sound of revolution. The musicians themselves live together in a commune, playing out a political as well as a social role. The commune, in fact, is the fundamental unit of the whole revolutionary libertarian idea. This particular commune, raided by the police a dozen times in the hunt for bader meinhof suspects, was built from an old leather factory by the people who lived there. It's the commune experience, they say, that's important. You can't expect people brought up in the old society to fit into the alternative without some drastic changes. And for that, it's essential first to break down the family unit, to develop non-family relationships. But of course, liberated women have children, and a great deal of care is put into bringing them up to fit into the world they want. Commune children eat, sleep and play together. Outside the commune, they join in what's known as Kinderladen. Originally, these groups were set up to allow commune mothers more time to attend political demonstrations. But a system soon began to build itself into the plan, 
the children were encouraged to develop free from any kind of inhibition, free from any competitive instinct. In Britain, these experiments in revolutionary lifestyle were slower to catch on. But when they did, it was in the Notting Hill area of West London that they first took root. In a very small way, the district became the nearest Britain had to San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury. It was, and in some senses still is, a centre for distant student dropouts, for anyone who wants to go to extremes in social and political life without too much attention from his neighbours, if not from the authorities. It was to this environment that Jake Prescott came after his release from Albany prison to put into practice the kind of politics Ian Purdy had been telling him about. Prescott began to mix with people who were beginning to organise themselves into revolutionary cells. And not only here in the decaying Victorian tenements of Notting Hill, but also in Manchester and Edinburgh. Soon there were more bombs. And then in December 1970 came the first clue to what was happening. A communique was sent to the International Times claiming the bomb attacks and it was signed Angry Brigade the first time the words had been used. The communique also claimed a machine gun attack on the Spanish Embassy. The gun, the 38 Beretta, was proved ballistically to be the same gun that was used on the American Embassy three years earlier. So here was direct evidence of a link between the 1st of May group and people now calling themselves the Angry Brigade. And as if to emphasise the point, just a month later, on January the 12th, 1971, came the most serious incident yet. Two bombs went off at the home in Barnard of the then Secretary for Employment and Productivity, Mr Robert Carr. And for the Angry Brigade, it was a serious error of judgement. Up to now, the bombings had been largely the preoccupation of the security services and the special branch. The explosions at Barnard were on an altogether different scale and they brought in for the first time trained investigators, CID men led by Detective Chief Superintendent Roy Habersham. The uh, second bomb uh, went off uh, shortly afterwards, uh, after the family had evacuated the house, and whilst Mr Carr and some police officers who had been summoned to the scene were actually standing there. And it was only uh, because the bomb flared a little that they were able to take cover. So we had the situation where two bombs, two unstable bombs had gone off, in circumstances which, as far as I was concerned, uh, amounted to attempted murder. But in his hunt for the bombers, Mr Habersham had some formidable problems, not least the vast communications gap between the police and the people they were dealing with. During one raid on the offices of the magazine Time Out, special branch detectives had the embarrassing experience of having to explain why they were there on film. Well, in fact, you're a member of the special branch, aren't you? I'm here as a police officer to do a, a specific job. There are official channels that you can go through, and I'm not one of them. But uh, seriously, I think it's a bit... Um, you can appreciate my position. How can I possibly say anything about it? I, I don't know the circumstances, and if I did, I wouldn't discuss them anyway. The police were often shocked by the lifestyle of the people they raided. Some of the communes they went into were far from the standards of hygiene and organisation reached in Germany. And there were shocks, too, for the people being raided. For many, it was their first taste of police methods. They didn't like being woken up in the middle of the night. They objected to the searching, and they were not the least bit sympathetic to what the police were trying to do. Well, this was a popular cry from uh, the people uh, that we were investigating, that we were merely harassing them for their left-wing views. This was not the case. As I say, I uh, had to uh, uh, get amongst these people because the... Uh, responsibility for the bombing clearly lay in this area. I had to get amongst them, I had to put my men amongst them, uh, and uh, my uh, view at that time, and uh, I still hold this view, that if people go about preaching violence and revolution, and a bombing of this sort occurs in that context, then they expect to be the object of police attention. But what sort of violence and revolution was it that the Angry Brigade were preaching? Well, much of what it was all about was in a newspaper a group of young people were preparing in Liverpool. Among them were John Barker, the Cambridge undergraduate who'd been so impressed by the situationists in Paris, Jim Greenfield, a friend of Barker's at Cambridge and academically quite bright, and two girls, Anna Mendelssohn, who'd done English literature at Essex University, she'd also been to Paris in 68, 
and Hilary Creek, another Essex student who'd taken part in university sit-ins and demonstrations. The four of them took part in the editing and compiling of Strike, contributing to the areas they were particularly interested in. Greenfield, Barker and Creek, for example, somewhat ironically as it turned out, wrote the section on judges and the law, advising people how to defend themselves. But whatever the hotchpotch of ideas expressed in the paper, one thing was clear. They were different from traditional left-wing views on almost every level. Marxist system is a better system. Capitalist system is a better system. As a black man. The people behind strike believed that the communists, in doctrine as well as in their papers, were always telling people what to do, devising policies for them, instead of getting out into the community, involving themselves, living with people and sharing their experiences. The way the four people involved with strike did this was through the squatting movement. Taking over empty property, living there and helping others to move in offered the kind of direct action that many young people were looking for. Many more were active in the claimants' unions, groups, there are about some 60 throughout the country, who make it their job to see that those with social security claims actually get what's due to them. And as many of the people involved in these movements are on social security themselves, like squatting, the claimants' union is another example of self-help and self-organisation. The political idea behind squatting and the claimants' union is to make people on the fringes of society aware of their situation and to fight it. In other words, to politicise them. If you can do that, the argument goes to the homeless, the unemployed, the aged, to the women's liberation movement, the gay liberation movement, even to the criminal fraternity, if you can politicise everyone who feels oppressed by society, then you've got on hand a vast revolutionary army, an army that will grow, they believe, until society as we know it collapses. And that society is what they call the spectacular society. It's a phrase the situationist used in Paris in 68, and it's defined in a book written by a Frenchman, Guy Debord. It's this book that John Barker had begun to translate before he was arrested. Briefly, what it says is that the world we see is the world we've been conditioned to see. And that conditioning, whether it's communist or capitalist, has brainwashed us into accepting material things as a substitute for real experience. It's made us lose the ability to relate to each other as human beings. And this, the book argues, is an act of violence. The Angry Brigade claimed that they were simply matching that violence, the violence of the state, with a violence of their own. And in communiques now sent out after every attack, they outlined the area of their activities. At last it began to put a whole series of bomb attacks stretching back two years into some kind of perspective. Embassies first, the American, Spanish and Italian. These were targets inspired by the 1st of May group. Next on the list, judges. In fact, the nearest they got was the Attorney General, Sir Peter Rawlinson, with a bomb at the door of his London home. High pigs, as the communique called the police. That was Sir John Waldron, the Metropolitan Police Commissioner. There was a bomb at his London home. Then the situationist targets, the so-called spectacles. Bieber's boutique was one example. The communique that went with it complained about the outdated, pointless fashions and about the boring life of the painted sales girls. Another spectacle was the Miss World contest, with a bomb at the BBC van to coincide with a women's liberation demonstration outside. As for property, there were dozens of attacks on banks, conservative committee rooms, territorial army centres, even on a computer. Not all the communiques were in this short staccato style. Some were a thousand words long, well argued, closely reasoned. And as well as giving some idea of the politics behind the attacks, they were forcing people in other revolutionary groups to define their attitudes to violence as well. Brian Michaels was prominent in the Stoke Newington 8 Defence Committee set up to help with the Angry Brigade's defence. Chris Allen was charged with Angry Brigade offences. He was dismissed from the case at the start of the committal proceedings. Ian Purdy stood trial on Angry Brigade conspiracy charges with Jake Prescott. He was acquitted. Prescott was sentenced to 15 years. Jane Greetham was one of many women prominent in defending the Angra Brigade. 
I think the angry brigade sort of saw that there were a lot of things wrong and really wanted to change things in a way. We felt very frustrated uh, and that sort of the attacks of the angry brigade, and they were attacks, yeah, that's clear. Um, were an attempt to sort of release some of that frustration you know, that, that a lot of people felt. I mean, I, don't, I, I think actually calling it, I mean, trying to specify it in terms of releasing frustration is perhaps incorrect. Yeah. I mean, rather more, I see it, was going to talk about the fact that, you know, the, 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 the ruling class actually just defined violence in terms of uh, a violent picket or a, a, a violent crime or a violent bank robbery or a violent bar, bomb going off somewhere or other, which is which totally distorts the real essence of what violence is. I think in some ways, you know, it, it can, um, the whole question of, of, of violence, um, state violence and, and anger brigade violence, because I mean, I think well, I'm actually talk specifically about anger brigade violence, yeah. uh, is it, sort of best expressed in a way or crystallise itself best in the world. Uh, when you look at Carr, I know on January the 12th, and I know about that experience very intensely because I was charged with it, because I had all the information more or less that was available to the police about it, in, in terms of my interrogation, what I learned there, in terms of, of uh, the depositions which one saw and the evidence that came out, that uh, it, was, it was directly confronting the state at that stage and it was, it was a struggle against the Industrial Relations Bill, which later became law. Uh, it was confronting Carr violently with the violence of which he was responsible for. In West Germany, the violent confrontation between the authorities and the Bader Meinhof group had grown to such proportions that to cope with it, the West German Secret Service was increased from a thousand agents to 1,500. They pulled men and women out of Iron Curtain countries, retrained them, and put them into their own universities. Their experience in dealing with the group and the information they've gleaned in the process has led the security authorities to regard the threat of urban guerrilla activity in general as greater to the stability of the country than anything the communists could offer. They reckon the days have gone when the power struggle is state against state. Now they say it's states against the people in them. One of the bader meinhof bomb factories revealed the scope and extent of their activities. Activities brought to an end because of the group's contact with the criminal world. They needed people to tell them how to get hold of explosives, how to rob banks, buy guns and cars. And some of the criminals who helped them were bought in turn by the police. It was when the Angra Brigade began to dabble in orthodox crime themselves, in their case it was fraud, that the end was in sight for them too. Jake Prescott, just a week after the attack on Robert Carr, was picked up in Notting Hill on suspicion of being drunk. On him were two checkbooks, stolen it transpired later from students at Oxford University. On remand at Brixton, Prescott began to boast about his knowledge of explosives, his contacts with the Angra Brigade. Word was sent to Mr. Habersham. He decided to let Prescott out of Brixton and to have him followed. As the picture emerged and as our inquiries spread, of course it became quite evident that uh, responsibility for these bombings clearly lay within within the circle of acquaintances that Prescott had and uh, it, it, we discovered that uh, in this same circle uh, lay responsibility for much of the fraud that was going on too so that this uh, as it were underlined our conviction that uh, the people we were after were within Prescott's circle. With Prescott's address book Habersham was able to narrow the field of suspects from virtually the whole of the so-called alternative society to some 50 or 60 people. Each one came into the frame as a possible Angra Brigade candidate, but the first Angra Brigade arrest was Prescott himself. He was charged with conspiring with others to cause explosions. Three weeks after Prescott's arrest, Ian Purdy was pulled in and also charged. But any idea that the police may have had that this had broken the back of the Angra Brigade was rudely shattered by five more explosions all claimed by the Angra Brigade with expansive communiques. At Scotland Yard, as the pressure grew to get more results, they asked for help from the security services. But they could offer little beyond Stuart Christie and the groups and organisations, mostly communist, who were getting support from abroad. The Angra Brigade was entirely homegrown. There were no leaders, no recognised structure, only friendship patterns the special branch had built up from address books and surveillance. 
Even when this knowledge was offered to the security services, they weren't much interested. Relations were often strained. But at least by now, there was a central point of reference at the yard, the bomb squad, set up under the command of Deputy Assistant Commissioner Ernest Bond. Uh, what in fact did happen was that the team investigating the car inquiry under Mr. Habersham was brought into Scotland Yard and they carried on their inquiries from there to coordinate the inquiries and this, why, this was why the bomb squad was formed. How useful was it? It was very useful indeed but I'd like to point out that this is not an unusual step for the police. I mean if we have any spate of incidents such as bank robberies or um, bombings of this sort we do concentrating inquiries in an effort to put a stop to it and of course the bomb squad was very successful. The bomb squad was soon investigating yet more attacks, including one on another government minister, Mr John Davis, who'd taken over from Mr Carr as Secretary for Trade and Industry. By now, the Anger Brigade had claimed some 30-odd attacks, and obviously they were running short of explosives. Money was no problem. Jim Greenfield, Anna Mendelssohn, John Barker were all engaged in a substantial fraud conspiracy the same conspiracy that Prescott had been involved in, stealing checkbooks and credit cards from students. To get the gel ignite, they arranged to consult their old allies, the 1st of May group. And for that, they had to go once more to France. Accounts of what happened there precisely differ between the police version, the prosecution assumptions, and the equally melodramatic explanations given by the people involved but the dispute's over motive rather than movement. No one denies that on Tuesday, August the 17th, 1971, Hillary Creek was in and around the Paris left bank. We've retraced the route she took. It began that day in the morning at the Maubert Mutualité metro station. The police claim she emerged at that time on her way to collect explosives from the 1st of May contacts. And that contact, they say, was Garcia Calvo, a lecturer in Latin at Lille University, and like Octavio Alberola, wanted by the Spanish police. Hilary Creek says she wasn't on her way to see Calvo, but to meet a man who would help her set up a news information service. The police say she went first to an address in the Rue de Bièvre, just off the Boulevard Saint-Germain, deep in the Latin Quarter. That address, Calvo's address, was found among her possessions. And it was from here, the allegation goes, that Creek, after a day's negotiations and dealings, collected 33 sticks of gelignite manufactured in France. The following day, on Thursday the 19th, with the explosives in a blue hold all, say the police, Hilary Creek made her way to the Gardenor station to catch the boat train to Boulogne. There's no question that with the right connections it's comparatively easy to get hold of explosives in France. So much is stolen every year that the authorities can't keep track of it all. The anarchist networks send it to Paris for distribution. Train 2025 to Boulogne and London. But to get it out of the country is quite another matter. This, said the police, is how the Angra Brigade did it. At the end of her train journey, Hilary Creek had arranged to meet two friends. One of them was John Barker. He admitted going to France, not to meet Creek, but as part of a plan to provide hideouts for Ian Purdy and Jake Prescott once they'd been sprung from prison. Again, the movements aren't in dispute. Hilary Creek arrived at Boulogne with a ticket for the 515 boat to Dover. She was in plenty of time, and according to the police, what happened next was carefully worked out. She'd been told to take the explosives to a particular part of the port, and there to wait for Barker and his companion. They would meet and divide the 33 sticks of dynamite between them. The idea was that if one of them got caught, the others could at least get some of it through. Barker and Creek admitted that they'd met, but they said it was a coincidence. He had gone over with a false passport on a day return ticket, but he'd gone as part of the plan to spring Purdy and Prescott. What is certain 
happened is that Creek, Barker and his companion did catch the 515 ferry back to Dover. Though they didn't know it at the time, they were sailing, in fact, straight to discovery. Late that night, Creek and Barker got back to the flat they were living in at Amherst Road in Stoke Newington, North London. The explosives were safely through the customs and together again in one place. The two of them went in to join the two other people living there, Jim Greenfield and Anna Mendelssohn. We've been looking for uh, these two people, Greenfield and Mendelssohn, for some considerable time. They were strong suspects, both for the fraud and the bombings. And uh, we'd had a number of uh, pieces of information about their whereabouts, and we kept observation on a good number of premises, but uh, without success. However, uh, in the middle of August, we got a piece of information that uh, Mendelssohn might be found at this address in Amherst Road. So, on the morning of August the 20th, the day after Creek and Barker had got back from France, the police began to keep watch on the house. Towards lunchtime, Jim Greenfield came out to make a telephone call at a nearby phone box. The police decided that the time had come to go in to pick him up and possibly Anna Mendelssohn for fraud. To their amazement, under a table clearly visible was a stand gun, and with it, scarcely hidden, was the Beretta, as it turned out, used on the American and Spanish embassies years before. There were revolvers, ammunition, a whole array of armory, and with it all, 33 sticks of French-made gelignite and a blue hold-all. The allegation that that material had been planted at Amherst Road, put there specifically by the police to obtain a conviction, formed one of the main defence planks in the Angry Brigade trial. That, and the charge, that the defendants were in the dock for their political beliefs. In fact, there were two trials. The first one related to Prescott and Purley. The charges were to do with the bombing at Robert Carr's house. Prescott got 15 years for his part in that. On appeal, it was reduced to 10. And Purdy was acquitted on all charges. And then followed the trial of the so-called Stoke Newington 8, the longest trial, longest criminal trial in legal history, and certainly one of the most controversial. Four of the defendants were actually living at Amherst Road at the time, Barker, Creek, Greenfield, and Mendelssohn. And four of their friends were also charged. Christopher Bott, who'd arrived at Amherst Road the day after the police raid, and two girls were charged, Angela Weir and Kate McLean. They were both heavily involved in women's lib. And finally, Stuart Christie. He had also arrived at Amherst Road the day after that raid. Now, three of the defendants, Barker, Creek, and Mendelssohn, chose to defend themselves. Their task was to convince the jury that the police were corrupt enough to have planted the material found at Amherst Road. To do it, they claimed that the police had invented oral statements, beaten one of them up, lied under oath, even suppressed forensic evidence. But would the jury believe this all-out attack on the police? Well, people in court who'd observed them closely throughout the trial were convinced there'd be a split. And there was. The defendants themselves felt seven of the jury were against them. Three were undecided. And it became clear when the judge was forced to accept a majority verdict that two were not prepared to convict them at any price. In the event, Barker, Creek, Mendelssohn and Greenfield were found guilty. The other four were acquitted. The jury asked for clemency and the judge decided to take that into account in the sentencing. Ten years each. He said that without the jury's plea, he would have given them 15. The four found guilty lodged appeals some months later, but these were dismissed. The court reflecting the views of the trial judge that it was sad to see such intelligent and educated people in their situation. Undoubtedly, they'd been brought there by a warped sense of sociology. That at least was the judge's view. But what about the Angry Brigade supporters? In many ways, sort of, you know, the Angry Brigade are sort of Revolutionaries, the armed revolutionaries, that they kind of, you know, I mean, of, 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 of the first hour, you know, they're the sort of first people who've actually taken up this position and the significance of what they've done. You know, it won't become clear for, for some years, because I think in, say, in three or four years' time, or even longer, that people then will relate to what they've done now, you know, um, and will think about that and think it's important, you know. And, 
Um, perhaps I don't think it's important now, but I understand that in some years' time. What the Anglo Brigade did was to disrupt the Brigade Unit in a very small way um, turn around and, 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 and say to the government, say to Carr, um, we're, we're hitting back. As for the police, as a result of their inquiries, they now understand the politics behind the violence. In future, they will be able to identify, isolate and deal with revolutionary groups much more effectively, and they'll need to. Already the 1st of May group have issued a declaration that they're ready to back up strikes and factory sit-ins by attacking what they call the power symbols of capitalist oppression, though precisely how they're going to do it hasn't yet been made clear. Britain, Germany, Italy, Switzerland, Holland, Turkey, Japan and the United States have all had trials in the past 18 months to deal with violent revolutionaries. It's taken them four years to get them under control. And in the process, both sides have learnt much about each other's methods. Any future violence and the techniques used to contain it will be bigger, stronger and bitter indeed. I can't see any, any other answer to the problem because once the state starts to take political hostages, as it is doing, then the only other answer is that political hostages will be taken in return. These bombings have been much more an announcement of the situation. We're going to have to no longer accept the legality or, or the confines of legality that are set by the state. What the Anglo Brigade did was to, in a very small way, turn around and say to the government, say to Carr, we're hitting back. If people go about preaching violence and revolution, and a bombing of this sort occurs in that context, then they must expect to be the object of this attention. Almost exactly seven years after the Angry Brigade trial ended in December 1972, the Old Bailey was the venue for another political conspiracy trial. The wording of the conspiracy charge gave rise to the name of the trial, the Persons as a Known Case as the six accused were charged with conspiring with each other and with persons unknown to cause explosions and to overthrow society. The jury, however, in spite of an almost direct order to convict by Judge Alan King Hamilton, asserted their right to oppose the political use of the courts and police against dissidents and acquitted all the anarchists. The case itself is a showpiece of the power of judges, particularly an extraordinary and unprecedented decision by the judge to recall the jury to court the day after their not guilty verdict to berate them for the decision. Ironically, one of the jury became an anarchist as a result of the trial. May the 24th, 1978, 65 Kensington Garden Square, London W2, 7am. A group of armed police acting on instructions from the special branch move in on the top floor flat. They arrest two young anarchists, members of the International Black Cross Organisation. Later that same day in Fleet Street, Albert Meltzer, one of the men who founded the anarchist Black Cross network, is on his way to work as a copy taker at the Daily Telegraph. By chance and amazing irony, one of the first stories he takes tonight is about the arrests. No names are mentioned, but Meltzer doesn't need them. He knows who it is. He brings a solicitor, the paper prints the story, and so begins the first anarchist clash with authority since the days of the Angry Brigade. 
But today's new wave culture is six years on from the libertarian era of the Stoke Newington Eight, as the Angry Brigade was sometimes called. Different people, different attitudes, different politics, different lifestyles. And above all, different reaction to it all from the authorities. A reaction conditioned by the years of terrorist war in Northern Ireland and the effect that that's had on security in Britain as a whole. Specifically though, the background of the trial that ended today starts at a scene that couldn't be further from the punk rock platform of an anarchist gig. The tiny island of Sanday in the Orkneys. Home of Stuart Christie, who lives here in a kind of self-imposed exile, running a successful anarchist publishing business. 2369. Well, I've just received your brochure, in fact, and I haven't had a chance. I've just come back from London. In the 60s, Christie was sentenced to 20 years in a Spanish jail for trying to blow up General Franco. Later, in Britain, he was charged with anger brigade offences, acquitted, and now spends a good deal of his time preparing, writing, and commissioning articles for an anarchist paper called The Black Flag. Okie dokie, Mr. Jeffrey. Right, thank you. Bye bye. Copies of the paper arrive in Sanday in bulk by plane from the printers in London every fortnight. Well, the black flag has two functions. One, to provide information regarding anarchist and libertarian prisoners throughout the world. And the other function is that of propaganda and um, comments on topical subjects from an anarchist perspective. So the message goes out from Stuart Christie's office in the Orkneys to black flag readers and anarchist prisoners all over the world. Sometimes the authorities let the paper through, sometimes they don't, and copies are destroyed or politely sent back. But there's one prison we do know the black flag got through to, we know because someone there read it, liked it and wanted to know more. That prison was long kept on Ireland. In 1975, the prison huts, or cages as they were called, were divided into groups. The provisional IRA prisoners in some huts, the loyalists in others, the official IRA separate again. In cage 14, towards the end of 1975, was an 18-year-old member of the Irish Republican Socialist Party, a breakaway from the official IRA. Ronan Bennett was in Long Kesh waiting for the result of an appeal against his conviction for murdering an RUC man during an armed robbery. To pass the time, Bennett started to read copies of the Black Flag. Bennett was intrigued by the views expressed in the paper and wrote off asking for more information about who worked for it and where it was published. His letter was printed in the next edition. In it, he said he wanted to establish contact with anyone sharing your politics who'd be willing to swap a few letters with him. Just one requirement, he said, it had to be a woman. That woman, on Stuart Chris's instructions, was to be Iris Mills, then the local secretary of the Black Cross. A New Zealand girl, she's a former probation officer, a BA in psychology, and an anarchist of long standing. She wrote back to Bennett and so began what can only be described as a lengthy political dialogue. The Long Kesh letters, as they came to be called at the trial, outlined Bennett's political views at the time. Resistance does more to politicise the working classes than any print or leaflets, he wrote. It's time to stop protesting and start fighting. Bennett said he'd always regarded anarchism as a joke. It was through his correspondence with Iris Mills that he began to take it seriously. Not, of course, that he was by any means the first person to do that. Well, anarchy is um, a universal human phenomenon in all societies, among all sorts of individuals, simply people who don't want to do what they're told and decide to do what they want to do. Now, the public view of anarchy is one of chaos and violence. Why do you think that is? That's a very complex question. I think the main reason why that still is the image of anarchy is that the media are very anxious to keep it so, and the press and television and radio will always label as anarchy anything which appears to be chaotic or disorderly. In fact, anarchy um, 
wants far more order than there was before, but they want it imposed from below rather than from above. But anarchism does have a, a violent background and violent beliefs. It has a violent line of belief. There, are, there always has been um, a small minority of anarchists who believe that the best way to cut through all the rubbish around us is by violence. Anarchist rock groups like Kratz, a growing phenomenon among the young these days, would certainly disapprove of that violent minority of anarchists Nicholas Walter was talking about. The group went round giving benefit concerts for the people on trial at the Old Bailey. Crass and what they represent are attacked politically from all sides. The right see them simply as criminals out to destroy the existing structures of society. The left see them as hopeless utopians, deviationists, nearer to a bunch of bandits. As for the authorities, they don't like anarchists in general because they're unpredictable. You can never tell how they're going to react to a given political situation. Safe, so long as their aggression expresses itself in music, for example. Dangerous if they decide on some kind of direct action against authority. The kind of action they suspected Ronan Bennett had been involved with in Belfast. But in Northern Ireland, at the beginning of 1976, the appeal court quashed Bennett's conviction for murder and after 14 months in Long Kesh, he returned to his old haunts a free man. Not that anyone with his kind of Republican background is ever really free in Belfast. Bennett knew that he'd be a prime target for the militant Protestant groups. And he also said he was worried about the RUC's constant presence on the streets of the city. He considered them a threat to his freedom as well. In his letters to Irish Mills, Bennett wrote about his disenchantment with the existing Irish terrorist organisations. He was looking for something new, he said, a group that had a tightly knit, effective military machine to back up its political gains. But overall, he was growing more interested in what Iris Mills was telling him. And what with that and the fact that life seemed far from safe in Belfast, he made up his mind to get out. In May 1976, Bennett arrived in Huddersfield, home of his long cash correspondent, Iris Mills, and before his Orkney days of Stuart Christie. A number of local secretaries of the Black Cross in different parts of the world have been murdered, well, they've been victims of very uh, strange accidents. And uh, throughout the world since then, local activists within the Black Cross have been victims of um, surveillance, strict surveillance, and under the close attention of the various security services of the world. And Huddersfield was no exception. The local special branch began to take an interest in Bennett and the people he was mixing with in the area. One clue to just why there was so much concern about Bennett emerged quite recently in a secret army intelligence report on future terrorist trends. In it, there are several references to the growth of links between the IRA and overseas terrorist groups. Specifically, the document says that the official IRA devotes much time and effort to maintaining links with subversive organisations in Europe. Was Bennett perhaps acting as a sort of official IRA infiltrator, using the Black Cross International Network for the Irish cause? Rightly or wrongly, it wasn't something the security people were prepared to leave to chance. A decision was taken to send Bennett back to Ireland. It was left to the Huddersfield police to do the job. They arrested Bennett and Iris Mills and applied for an exclusion order under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. But the move failed. The assessor judged that there wasn't enough evidence to justify Bennett's exclusion and they were both released convinced now that the authorities were out to get them at any price, that for Bennett, England wasn't so safe after all. Over the years, Paris has had more than its share of violence in pursuit of political aims. 
The city's also traditionally been a centre for anarchist politics. It's even said that the Sacre Coeur Cathedral in Montmartre was built by grateful authorities to celebrate victory over the communards in 1871. For a few brief months, the people of Paris had taken the law, the government and the army's weapons into their own hands to establish a self-managed workers' commune. It was their defeat on the barricades and the huge number of casualties they sustained at the hands of government troops that finally persuaded some of their leaders to abandon the idea of open, head-on confrontation with the state and to build up secret societies, underground networks instead. That tradition has come down to the present day. Dozens of exiled terrorist groups base themselves here including one called the International Revolutionary Solidarity Movement, the 1st of May group, which had links with the Angra Brigade and which say the police provided them with their weaponry. Into this highly charged political atmosphere in the summer of 1977 came Mills and Bennett. Armed with the addresses of Black Cross contacts, they were accepted as comrades and received as people being persecuted by the police. As they began to mix in the student life of the city, they were warned not to get involved with anyone suspected of being watched by the authorities. Towards the end of 1977, one of the issues students in France and elsewhere in Europe were concerned with was the terrorist situation in West Germany. After the deaths of Bader, Meinhof and Enslin in the Stamheim prison, there were demonstrations throughout Europe. Britain had a support group called Black Aid, based largely on rising free bookshop in Islington. Again, its roots go back to the days of Agitprop and the Angra Brigade. Well, although not everyone in the collective is an anarchist, we all share common political beliefs and that we're opposed to exploitation, oppression, and class divisions within society. Rising Free's main function is to disseminate literature, to give people the opportunity to read about, develop, understand um, non-manipulative, non-authoritarian alternatives to what exists today. Not everyone who bought books from Rising Free, of course, necessarily shared the same political views. There were debates and disagreements even among members of the Black Cross. Bennett and Mills, for example, disapproved of the hero worship some people seem to be giving to the Bader Meinhof group. But another Black Cross member, Daffis Ladd, who'd been deported from West Germany because of his terrorist connections there, disagreed. He supported anyone prepared to take arms against the state. One of Ladd's political associates was Stuart Carr, who'd served with him in Albany prison. He told police later that he'd always been interested in politics. That's why I'm a thief, he said. Carr was still meeting in Black Cross and Rising Free Circles and at meeting there and at Conway Hall where Iris Mills was working as letting secretary, a group began to emerge with a common interest in the kind of politics that the authorities obviously found unacceptable and something to keep a very careful eye on. But it wasn't until Mills and Bennett were living at Kensington Garden Square that the police were finally given orders to move in on them. On the pretext of searching for stolen medical cars, the special branch organized a raid. The man who briefed the police before they went out was a special branch officer who'd been on many raids himself in the past, this one at time out during the hunt for the anger brigade. Special branch detective Roy Creamer, an anarchist specialist, is the man at the yard most familiar with the politics and personality of the so-called libertarian left. He told the local police what to look for. What they found, though, wasn't that much. Inside the flat, there were signs hidden away of the clandestine life, false passports, birth certificates, and stolen driving licenses. There was a kind of weed killer that can be used in explosives, and with it, the anarchist cookbook, a kind of do-it-yourself guide to bomb-making, booby traps, and poisons. The kind of book, the prosecution said later, that no law-abiding person would have in this country, a recipe for death and mutilation. The defendants said they regarded the anarchist cookbook simply as a joke. Nevertheless, as a result of what the police found, Mills and Bennett were arrested and charged with conspiracy to cause explosions. Next day, BBC Television News broadcast a warning from the police. 
Scotland Yard have just issued an appeal for information about a car connected with an alleged bomb plot. They believe the car, a beige Fiat 124 saloon, registration number XTP 753J, could be in the London area. The public are urged not to go near or touch the car, but to call the police immediately if they spot it. Tonight's appeal comes as a young couple were charged with conspiring to cause explosions following a police raid on a Bayswater flat earlier this week. In fact, the car was found a few days later at the bottom of a cliff in South Wales. It had been driven there by Daffoth Ladd, who'd seen the warning on BBC television news and panicked. Ladd himself was arrested soon after and also charged with conspiracy to cause explosions. His fingerprints had been found in Mills and Bennett's flat. But some of the police looking into the case were concerned that they may have jumped the gun a bit. After all, there hadn't actually been any explosions. The evidence generally was pretty thin. Until, that is, they picked up Ladd's prison friend, Stuart Carr. Under interrogation, Carr made a long confession. There was indeed a group, he alleged, committed to a bombing campaign. In Redchurch Street in East London, they'd opened a kind of workshop and headquarters, he said. But much more interesting to the police was Carr's information with names that they'd organised a whole series of robberies to provide themselves with money and weapons. But there was still no real evidence. When the police searched the premises at Redchurch Street, again they found nothing the police began to check out the people named in Carr's statement. Vince Stevenson from Rising Free was one. Stevenson took two days to give the police his address, and when they finally got it out of him and went there, they could hardly believe their luck. By a bed was a hold all full of arms and ammunition, a treasure trove of evidence, the jackpot, as one policeman exclaimed at the time. The charge of conspiracy to cause explosions, which had always looked pretty thin, was dropped, and the police now concentrated on conspiracy to rob. As a result of their surprise find in Stevenson's flat, there was one more arrest, a friend of his from Rising Free, Trevor Dalton. He had the key of the hold all in his pocket. His name was added to the list of those charged with conspiracy to rob, and so now there were six. Mills and Bennett, the Black Cross anarchists, Ladd and Carr, the Black Aid German supporters, Stevenson and Dalton from the Rising Free Bookshop. From the outset, the trial itself was controversial, not least because of the decision to vet the jury. When the Guardian newspaper published the results of the vetting, a full-scale inquiry was started to find out who'd leaked it. The Old Bailey trial was the culmination of an immense amount of time, effort and expense, surveillance, collecting evidence, changing the charges. The determination to get them all into court was positive in the extreme. But as today's acquittals prove, in this particular skirmish between the anarchists and the authorities, the authorities lost. Though there's no doubt that the confrontations will continue, because it's not so much the message that Stuart Christie sends south in his black flag newspaper that concerns the authorities, it's the way the paper keeps open the lines of communications between so many different international groups. For many years, these groups have been able to frighten governments out of all proportion to their men. Morning, George. How much, George? More parcels? Ten more. There are those who dearly like to see the Sanday postmistress handle a much lighter burden. <laughs>